Hello. Today we are continuing our study of the uh, gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. And there's so many things to discuss. In fact, the gospel, the good news about Jesus is eternal. It's an eternal gospel. We'll be hearing about the gospel throughout eternity. And I never get tired of speaking on this uh, wonderful subject, and I never will. But today I want to talk about one aspect of this good news message, and that is our guilt. What are we going to do with our guilt? How do we get rid of our guilt? Many people, as you know, are wrestling with guilt, and, and it's something that you've wrestled with yourself, and there's no doubt about it. Maybe um, we feel guilty about something we said. Maybe we feel guilty about something we have done. And sometimes, even years later, we can wrestle with guilt over feelings of something that was done or not done even, or said or not said, many years before. And maybe you're listening to our talk here on this subject today, and you're wrestling with guilty feelings yourself. And maybe you're asking this very question right here, can I ever be free from guilty feelings? Or uh, do I just have to live my entire life feeling guilty? And so let me ask you, what do you do with your guilt? Well, I want to begin today by, first of all, defining guilt. So that's always a good place to start. We need to make sure we're talking about the same thing. And this is a definition that I saw that I think really encapsulates what this is. Guilt is that which a person incurs when he or she violates a rule or a law. When we talk about a law, we're talking about a rule and vice versa. But everyone has done this. There, You've never met anyone in your life who hasn't, in, hasn't violated a rule or a law and then felt guilty about that. Even if a person says that um, they, they don't believe in God, and they don't uh, believe in guilt, they, they still, they, they might say, well, I don't believe in God's moral law. Well, even that person believes in guilt. So no one, I don't believe anyone would say, I don't believe in guilt. They do believe that they violated some rule or some law, and laws are just an inescapable reality, aren't they? We, we have rules and laws all around us. We have laws that are imposed upon us from the time that we're born. Our parents impose laws upon us when we're born. When we go to school, teachers have rules or laws. And as we age, we're introduced to more and more laws in society, in religion, in neighborhoods, in counties, in states, in countries. There are even international laws. You break a law and internationally, nations say, you should be prosecuted for violating these laws. And some of these rules are uh, temporary. Some laws and rules don't last very long. You know, your parents might give you some uh, rule about uh, eating all of your vegetables, but when you get a certain age, they, that rule no longer applies to you. They no longer insist that you have to eat everything on, on your plate or something like that. Some rules or laws are temporary. Other laws are permanent. For example, um, you, uh, as I said, um, you, you could have laws concerning eating when you're a child, but some laws like moral laws that God has uh, created and are actually a, a part of his very character, they're permanent. You know, schools used to make a really big deal about chewing gum. And now I think it's more about getting your phones out. Now, when I was a, a boy, a, a, a lad going to school, nobody had cell phones. No teacher was concerned about students getting their phones out. Nowadays, that's a bigger problem, I think most teachers would say, than chewing gum in class. And so, and they're concerned about maybe texting in class as well. And then there are rules that, you know, we have like, a neighborhood association might have rules, and one neighborhood might have a, diff a, a whole set of different rules than another neighborhood has. We have counties that might have rules, 
that are different from the county right next door to it. States have rules that are different from one state to another. Governments have rules that are different. And, and so there's rules everywhere. If you go to an assembly, I don't care whether it's a school assembly or a religious assembly, there's going to be rules for that assembly. There's rules for driving your car, for riding in a bus or riding in an airplane. There's rules for everything that we do. And on top of that, we may or may not like these rules. We may disagree with these rules. And some people might even say, I'm not going to obey these rules uh, because I don't like them. And other people say, I can't obey these rules because they're sinful, they're wrong. And, and so there are many rules and many of these are uh, socially uh, re or religiously accepted rules, but they're not government rules. And they may not even be biblical rules but maybe certain religions have made these rules. Like I grew up in a, in a group where they made a rule that women can't wear pants. And so that was a rule. It's not in the Bible, but they made a rule about that. Or you can't have instruments played in the service when you're singing songs. You see, again, that's not in the Bible, but it was a rule that maybe the religious group I grew up with uh, had. Other people have rules where the women, even today, have to wear dresses down to their ankles. And so you see, these are religiously, in that group, accepted rules or laws that they expect people to keep. And socially, we have rules as well. Um, I, I, you know, I, I could tell you quite a few uh, rules or laws. Sometimes they're the exact opposite, though, in different countries. When I was living in Africa, if you wanted to show esteem and honor for uh, a leader in a church or uh, a leader of a city or village, you, you didn't speak to them and address them while you were standing. You would shake their hand and then you would go sit down and you would sit lower than them and then you would greet them. That was that was their way of greeting. Now, in the United States, I and you know, when I grew up in some British schools, you stood up. You never sat down to speak to an older person. And you you uh, took your hat off. You see, that was a rule. When you walked in a building or you were speaking to someone of, um, of more honor than you, to show respect, you took your hat off. These are rules that you see people have in cultures. And so uh, we usually... Um, we don't have we don't have an opportunity to make many of these rules or these laws that we have to keep. You you don't usually make maybe even the neighborhood association laws. You usually don't make the religious laws in your religious group. You don't make a lot of times the laws that are that you have to obey in your county or in your state or in your country. You don't make the rules, for example, of uh, riding on a bus or an airplane. Children don't make the rules, most of the time at least, on uh, eating or something like that at home. These or, or staying off the TV and going to bed at a certain time at night. They don't make those rules. Most of us have, we have rules all around us in many spheres of our lives, and we don't make those rules, uh, hardly any rule do we make. And so let's go back now to guilt. What does guilt mean? Well, guilt is incurred, remember, when we violate a rule or a law. And we as believers believe that God is the ultimate lawmaker. He's the one who makes the laws, the rules, by which he holds every person responsible. God has rules. God has laws. And some people falsely say, you know, God isn't about rules. He's not about laws. He's all about love. And uh, he says, for example, in Romans chapter six, he says, we're not under law, but we're under grace. And God is a God of love, some people say, and uh, not commands. Well, I want to tell you something. 
Yes, God is about love, but that's because love is one of the rules. He commands, you see, us to love him and to love one another. Love is a command. So this is just a fact of life from the very beginning that God is the ultimate lawgiver. And, and we're going to say here in a moment, but, but God has put these moral laws upon our hearts. Everyone in the world, uh, I'll say it probably here in a moment again, but everyone knows that it's wrong to, to take someone's life. Everyone knows it's wrong to commit adultery. Everyone knows it's wrong to steal. Everyone uh, uh, knows these other things as well. These are laws that God has put upon someone's heart, everyone's heart. Everyone knows these. Now, obviously, if there was no God, you know, we wouldn't have to worry about breaking his rules because he doesn't have any rules if he doesn't exist. And one of the reasons uh, why I believe, and some people would say that there are atheists today, is because uh, they know that if you believe in God, they, they know that you have to believe these rules and you're going to be held responsible by God. And they would rather not think about having to stand before God and, and give an account in judgment day for breaking his rules or laws. And so that's why some people will claim at least, profess many times, that they are atheists. However, many of these people who claim to be atheists, when they get in a foxhole and everyone around them maybe is dying and getting shot, a lot of them come to know God real quick. And so they weren't really true atheists. So denying the existence of God doesn't make it true is what I'm saying. I can deny the authority of a governor over a state, but simply denying the authority of that uh, governor doesn't make it true. So let's talk now a little bit about guilt. Again, we said, what is guilt? Um, guilt is uh, that which a person incurs when he violates a rule or a law. And I want to talk about this in connections to feelings of guilt. Now, we all um, understand how the criminal justice system works. We have some idea, at least, of how it works. When someone breaks a law that has been established by the government, that person is arrested many times for breaking that law, and that person may have to appear in court. Maybe they're not arrested, but there's just a, a ticket. They get a ticket, and they have to appear in court. And maybe the person says they're not guilty. And in such a case as this, here in the United States, we have juries, or we can be judged by a judge. And then the evidence for that trial is presented, we all understand, and at the very end, the jury or the judge is going to decide the verdict, what they think the, the facts uh, tell them about this particular charge against this individual. And so they decide, what they're deciding is whether a person is in fact guilty in the eyes of the law for breaking a law or whether they're not guilty. And there's a whole wide range of, of trials. You know, a few years ago, there, was a, there were two trials uh, over a, a murder. O.J. Simpson was tried in a criminal court and found to be not guilty. And then he was tried in a civil court and he was determined to be guilty. And so you see, you got two different outcomes for the same incident, but they were different courts. One was criminal and one was civil. So um, as you can see, there's a lot of different laws, a lot of different courts, a lot of different circumstances like that. Now, all of us have broken laws. And sometimes we didn't even know we were breaking a law. And sometimes we, we, we knew it was wrong to do what we did, and we went ahead and did it anyway. We know in advance it's wrong. We just go ahead and break it. In fact, sometimes we might have, many people do, scheme to break a law. And they, and they actually get away uh, with executing this particular sin. But God has put, uh, as I said earlier, he's put these moral laws in our hearts. They're, they're universal. 
Everyone, as I said, has knows that it's wrong to lie. They know it's wrong to murder. They know it's wrong to, to commit adultery. They know it's wrong to steal. You see, God has put these things on, in our hearts, and we know this. In um, Romans chapter 2, uh, this is what Paul teaches in Romans uh, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. I won't read that passage just now for the sake of time, because we have a lot of things we need to talk about, uh, about guilt. But again, that's what we are taught there. We're taught that God has put these into our hearts. And so some people know they can read the Bible and read the Ten Commandments and know it's wrong. But other people have never read the Bible, never read the Ten Commandments, but they still know it's wrong to murder, to lie, to steal, to commit adultery. They already know these things because God has put it in their hearts. So in other words, what we're saying is um, real guilt is objective. It's an objective thing, but when you have a feeling of guilt, that's subjective. So first of all, let me talk about real guilt um, and, and show you that it's different from just feeling guilty. People experience guilt, not inanimate objects. If a truck is driving down the road, and I've had trucks do this, maybe you have as well, and they kick, their tires kick up a rock into my windshield and chip it or maybe even crack it, that rock doesn't feel guilty. There's no guilt at all. That, that rock has no ability to feel guilt. But if a person threw a rock into a windshield knowingly, that person has the ability, if they're not a sociopath or a, a psychopath, to feel guilt. Uh, sometimes they have more of a difficult uh, time. But uh, our, our uh, feelings, in other words, they're not always parallel to our guilt. And, and so if, if a person gets a ticket, some people take that ticket and simply throw it in the trash can. They don't care that we call people who commit uh, petty crimes like this uh, scoff laws. They scoff at laws that uh, are difficult to enforce. They know people, nobody's going to do anything about it. They know nobody's going to come after them or, or send a warrant that they have to pay this. They know that's not going to happen. And so they don't worry about that law. And they flaunt these laws and evidently, uh, many times have no remorse whatsoever. Now, as I said, you can take it to a higher level and you can talk about psychopaths and you can talk about sociopaths. And, you know, the word path in those words means, uh, uh, it means feelings or, or suffering. It actually means suffering. And so, um, and it means feeling as well. And so uh, these type people right here, they, they seem, at least, to not care about how other people feel, how other people suffer. They can lie and, and not feel any kind of guilt. They can break rules and not feel guilty. And um, sometimes, in other words, it's not, it's not in proportion to the guilt that they have, um, the law that they've committed. And so, um, let, let's say that you uh, a person commits a crime and they had ill intent toward a person. They injure maybe a person. Maybe even they commit murder. They execute a, a murder. And you've got all this evidence against them. They're arrested. You've got DNA. You've got video. You've got eyewitnesses. And this person goes to court and they ask them, how do you plead? And that person can say guilty or not guilty. But let's suppose they, they say, I'm not guilty. And let's suppose in this country, you can choose to defend yourself without a lawyer. And so let's suppose that this person stands up in court and says, I'm not guilty. And the reason I'm not guilty is I don't feel guilty. I don't care about all this evidence, the eyewitnesses, the DNA, the video. I don't give a hoot about all any of that 
my subjective feelings indicate that I'm innocent. I can't be guilty of this murder because I don't feel guilty. Now, how far do you think that would go in a courtroom? In other words, what I'm trying to show, just because a person doesn't feel guilty or say they don't feel guilty, doesn't mean they're innocent. Because a person doesn't feel guilt, doesn't say anything about whether or not, in fact, that person is guilty. And uh, many times people uh, don't feel guilty for breaking God's laws, not just murder, but other kinds of laws as well. In fact, Jeremiah talks about this. He uh, uh, rebuked the people because he said they, they refused to blush with shame for all the sins that they're, they're uh, committing. You see, they had lost all sense of shame. And so anyway, the only thing I'm trying to point out right here is there's a large gap many times between real guilt and someone feeling guilt. But the scripture also says this, that we can repeat a sin over and over again. And, and as a result, we can stop losing feeling toward uh, that committing that particular sin. Paul said this, 2 Corinthians, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit expressly states that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith, listen, whose consciences are seared with a hot iron. In other words, you know, it's like a, a nail or you do something with your hands. My hands are soft because I don't work outside much. And so I can develop... Um, blisters very easily. And those blisters are very painful at first, aren't they? But you know, if I do that repeatedly, my hand develops some hard calluses, some hard blisters. And as and then I can do, you know, rake leaves or, or uh, dig some holes in the yard and I won't, it won't hurt. I can do it without it hurting. Well, that's the way God's law is. That's what Paul is saying right here. A lot of people they, you know, when you first start committing a lot of sins, you feel guilty. But if you just repeatedly do it, your conscience can become seared. And all of a sudden, you know, you take the the, the nerve endings out, out of your hand or whatever to where you're not feeling the pain anymore. You're not feeling guilty over transgressing God's law. And so that's what we see here. And objectively, some have not transgressed God's law, or and they've not transgressed actually any law, actually, but they feel guilty. And I think this has to do with a lot of people who are legalistic. You know, a lot of people can just make a law, you know, these churches and religions, they can make these laws and people feel guilty if they break these laws. And the Bible doesn't condemn it at all. But but because, you know, they want to look good in the eyes of others or whatever, they can they they know that those people are saying that it's a sinful behavior and they're imposing these as laws upon people and and um and we call that legalism. You see you you're making making it legal. You're trying to say this is the law. And people can actually feel guilty, and they're not guilty at all. I I, I know um, I grew up in a in a group that I said as I said they made a law that women can't wear pants. That's a sin. Well, it's not a sin. But but women in that group, if they do it, they try to hide it from everybody else in that group. And some people, if they did it, they would feel like they were sinning. And the same can be said of alcohol. In the group I grew up with, it's a sin to drink any kind of alcohol. Well, guess what? It's not a sin to drink alcohol. Uh, what's a sin in God's word is drunkenness. Drunkenness is a sin. Now, I wouldn't recommend people drinking alcohol if just to go do it because it can be very dangerous. And I think it's very hard on your liver. But it's not a sin to drink some alcohol. It's a sin to get drunk. So what I'm saying is we can become real professionals at si silencing 
the feelings of real guilt. But some of these things are not um, wrong at all. And so let's talk now about real guilt. Let's how how do people nowadays? What are some ways that people deal with their guilt? Well, one way that people deal with uh, guilt, and I'm talking about real guilt, and sometimes our feelings of guilt are are for real guilt as well. But sometimes, as I said, our feelings of guilt aren't. Uh, it, we haven't committed anything really, but we still feel guilty. I'm talking about also denying um, that you've sinned How, and, and you know you've sinned. How do people deal with it? Well, one thing we do, we all know, is sometimes people deny they, that they've done anything wrong. And, and we try to deny it to others. We try to deny it to ourselves. And sometimes we actually can fool ourselves. We can lie to ourselves enough to where we actually believe that we haven't done anything wrong. In other words, you've heard this many times, I'm sure, before. Denial is not just a river in Egypt. It, it's uh, it's real. And as I said, a lot of times people say, well, I don't believe in God. Well, I think they're trying to deny the fact that uh, they have real guilt. Here, here is what um, Paul said uh, earlier. This is a verse that I, I skipped. But he says in verse uh, 15, um, he says, they show that the requirements of the law, these non-Jews, are written upon their hearts. Their consciences also bear witness, and their thoughts, sometimes accusing, and at other times even defending them. And so that's what we said earlier. Everyone knows that there are some things that are right and some things that are wrong. We can't miss it. It's our conscience. But um, most of us, especially if we're denying our guilt, we usually try to adjust our, our ethics downward because we want an ethic that we can live with because this guilt is too hard to live with. So we have to just adjust our ethics downwards. We want a moral code that we can reach. And when we do that, we're just living in denial of our guilt before God. It doesn't change the fact that we're not guilty. And this is one of the reasons, by the way, that many works-based religions, by that I mean they, they say, oh, you're saved by your works. This is why many of them try to make these concrete rules or laws. Uh, and the reason is, is they want to feel good about, hey, I accomplished these and look at all the other people who don't do, you know, what I do. And so they can judge other people, but they're living in denial of real guilt that they have with God. And so we, um, there's a real sense in which we need to listen to our conscience. And we need to make sure, you know, there was a, a, a Walt Disney movie um, about Jiminy Cricket or, or Pinocchio. And um, one of the famous uh, lines in that, that movie was, let your conscience be your guide. Well, I'll tell you what, your conscience is not a, a perfect guide. There is a real sense in which we ought to keep our conscience tender, but it must always be instructed by God's word. And our consciences can sometimes, as Paul said, accuse us and sometimes can defend us. But um, we need to be careful that we are um, listening to it. Here, here is what Jeremiah said uh, to the people. He said, you have the brazen look of a prostitute, but you refuse to blush with shame. We've got to be careful that our conscience is tender and that it can be affected. Another, what do other people do about uh, their guilt? Sometimes people just make an excuse. They, they say, you know what? Yeah, I did it, but it's not as bad as what so-and-so did. I, I've been in prisons, and these people who have committed horrific crimes, maybe they've committed murder, I don't know, some, but uh, I can't remember specifically what some of them are. Man, they look down on people who are 
who are sexual perverts, they call them. They have to keep them in a separate part of the jail and in separate prisons because they'll stab and kill those people. Well, they've probably committed a lot of sexual crimes themselves, but they haven't been arrested for those. And they look and and they they've literally told me, uh, I'll never forget it. They said, at least I'm not, you know, one of those sexual perverts on, you know, the so-and-so floor. Well, that's what we tend to do. We tend to look down on someone who, you know, who commits crimes or sins that we haven't committed. But um, there's going to be a time when we all stand before God and none of us are going to be able to make an excuse. This is what uh, Paul said. He says, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. When you, when you walk into uh, the judges or jury walks into a courtroom, many times you'll hear them say, silence in the court. And, and there will be this moment of silence when the judge walks in or when the, uh, the jury walks in. And, and you stand up out of respect, right? That's one of our, our customs. As I said, other countries may not have this particular custom. But we, I, I don't know about that in a courtroom. But in the United States, we stand up, don't we, to show respect. But I'm going to tell you something. God's word tells us that on the final judgment, this silence will be maintained. Every mouth is going to be stopped. There's not going to be any excuse no rationalizations, no denials, no alibis, no protestations of innocence. Everybody is going to be without excuse as a transgressor of God's laws. In God's court, we are guilty, and we uh, can never say anything or do anything that's going to change that. It's absolutely futile to try to justify ourselves before God. And this is just another way to uh, stifle or to quench this voice in our conscience. And one of the reasons we do this is because guilty feelings are painful. And so we, we, this is the way we deal with guilt a lot of times. This is what we think is the best thing to do. Well, another thing that people do is they ignore their sins. They ignore breaking God's law. Uh, I, I know uh, a situation, very close relative of mine, and um, he had cancer. He, was, um, he had blood in his urine. He had it for some time, and he did not go to the doctor. And the reason he didn't go to the doctor is he was afraid that they would tell him he had cancer. And so he just refused to go to the doctor, kept it from everybody until he passed out and went to the doctor and he didn't live very long. But, it, but uh, the son of that man told me, he said, you know, he had a cancer that was very treatable. And had he gone to the doctor the first time he started passing blood, he probably would have lived another, you know, 10, 15 years. He was in his... Uh, uh, 70s, early 70s or so when he, when this happened. So the reason I'm telling that story is a lot of people think, if I just ignore the fact that I've sinned against God, maybe it'll go away. It, it's not going to go away. And, and so God, this is when, when, when we experience guilt, it's God's way of telling us there's something wrong. You got blood in your urine. There's some, you need a physician. And so this is what people do. Sometimes they just say, well, I'm just going to ignore it. It's not going to go away. Another thing that people do is they count on indulgences for to, you know, overcome their transgressions. But, you know, now in our society, this happens sometimes. You know, someone, if they commit a, a, a crime, they have to make up for it through restitutions. Maybe they have to go pick up trash on the highway or whatever, but there's something they can do to make up for that transgression. I'm going to tell you something. There's a big difference between transgressing laws of men and laws of God. You can't make up for your transgressions uh, against God. 
there the there's a restitution that you can't pay and there's a great story about this in in matthew chapter 18 where where um you know there's a man who is unforgiving towards someone who owes him just a little bit well he uh, uh, he was forgiven of something that he had no ability to pay. It was way beyond his means of paying. But he uh, was hard on someone who didn't pay him just a, a, a small little amount. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. You, you, you must understand that there is a debt that we owe to God that we can never repay. Don't, don't believe this thing. You know, sometimes you'll hear this statement, boys are going to be boys. Girls are going to be girls. Uh, I don't expect them to be perfect. So I'm not going to hold them responsible for this, you know, guilt. Let me tell you something. Lots of people, millions of people are, are counting upon this. And um, they they think, just try your best. I I have heard on a few occasions, I don't know how many preachers in this group I grew up in and someone, and, and I've heard many times at their funerals, this is many times, they preached them into heaven. The only thing they did was go to their church. That's all they did was attend. But they were always faithful to that particular group. And so they say, well, they were a faithful member of this church. And they basically preached them into heaven, literally say that they're saved eternally because they went that's all they did was go to church well i want to tell you something you're you you can't be saved by what you do um and i often illustrate it like this let's say that salvation was jumping across the grand canyon i don't know how many miles it is across the grand canyon but the world record for long jump is 30 feet and so you've got this great athlete maybe he jumps farther than anybody out there he jumps 30 feet before he sinks down and dies in the Grand Canyon. He's not even close to the several miles that you have to jump to be saved and go to heaven. And there's some other great athletes that can jump 20 feet out there. That's a long ways. And then there's some people that can jump 15 and, and 10. And I might can jump five feet out there. There's going to be elderly people get right to the edge and they're just going to fall down. I'm going to tell you something. That person that jumped 30 feet out there to save themselves on the way down, they're not going to brag and say, hey, Jimmy, I jumped six times farther than you did. You know what? They, I'm going to tell them if they say that to me, I'm going to say, so what? We're both going to be dead in about two seconds. And I'm not going to turn around to the person who can only jump a foot off the edge and say, I jumped five times out here farther than you did. Because if I do, you know what they're going to tell me? So what? We're both going to be dead in about two seconds. None of us have gotten close to jumping several miles across the Grand Canyon to save ourselves. If you could jump within an inch of the other side, you're going to die just like, the, just like me who can jump maybe five feet out there. You see, you, there's nothing to boast about. We've all sinned. We, we're all in the same boat religiously. We've all sinned, and we can't jump across the Grand Canyon to save ourselves, you see. And we're going to stand before God. And, and restitutions won't do it. You know, I, I, I did more good works than you. I jumped five times farther. I jumped five feet out there because I did some good works in my lifetime here or there. And, and I did five times more than you did. It's not going to do it. That, that's not going to count as restitution in God's um, economy. And then the last one we'll talk about today, and I'll, I'll try to go back to this next Lord's Day and finish up because it's too long. But uh, like I, I just spoke about that, you can't undo it by good works. A lot of people think, man, I, I'm guilty. I know I'm guilty. I know people who have you know, committed horrific crimes, <laughs> They've never been arrested for them, but they they've committed, you know, some crimes. And I hear people who work for them and everything, you know, talk about how dishonest they are with money and different things. They've committed some serious crimes and and sinned 
against others and against God. But then at the same time, I know these people, man, they, they'll see someone like me and they'll, you know, really talk, you know, be really generous here, 20 bucks or something to somebody and really want everybody to see it. And um, I believe they're, they're living with guilt because they've been sinning for decades like this. And they think if they do some good things that people see, maybe people pat them on the back and make them feel good. And maybe they won't uh, be, um, you know, guilty in God's sight. Maybe that'll do away with their guilt. It won't do away with your guilt. I want to tell you some good news before we conclude. That uh, the good news is that God has done something for you. Now, the bad news is his moral laws must be kept with perfection. And you haven't done it. And no one has. Except one man. It's through the obedience of one man. And that one man isn't you or anybody else you've ever met in this lifetime. It's Jesus. He kept all of God's laws perfectly. And God demands that you keep them perfectly, but you haven't. And so what God demands, he has graciously provided for you in his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus met all the demands of the law, and our guilt requires the death penalty. The wages, the payment for our sins is death. But Jesus paid that penalty for us. And he earned righteousness. And his righteousness is credited to us by faith. When we put our trust in his word, not us. Because you, you say, well, you got to obey. And all, I'll tell you what, if you do, you better obey all of them. You can't just say, well, you got to obey these to go to heaven. Well, you better obey all of them to go to heaven. If you're going to depend upon your works, you better obey all of them. Or you can say, I don't depend on any of them. I depend on Jesus, his work for me. And once you come to that kind of faith in God, it, you experience real forgiveness and you can get rid of all of your guilt. You don't have to live with guilt anymore. That burden is, is taken off of your shoulders. You no longer have guilt in God's sight. And it's completely forgiven. All right, God, God willing, I'll, I'll take this back up because my next point, next Lord's Day, I want to talk about how God, his methods of dealing with guilt. These are just a few of you know, our methods, what we try to do a lot of times. Probably every single one of us is, has been guilty of trying to uh, deal with guilt in these ways, but it won't work. It's not a legitimate way to deal with guilt. And next Lord's Day, God willing, I'm going to try to go more in depth with God's methods of dealing with guilt. All right, we will stop there and uh, may God bless you.